Good evening, and if you like spending hours slumped spread-eagled on a sofa, or even if you just like watching TV, <laughs> welcome to the programme which does for television what Film 92 has done for ballroom dancing. It's a cruise round the week's TV offerings, and I use the word in its purely sacrificial sense. Uh, we'll be looking at what you've been watching, what you haven't been watching, what you wanted to watch but set the video wrong, and uh, got the second half of Songs of Praise instead, and what you never wanted to watch in the first place and are slightly peeved at having to sit through all over again. But uh, first, let's refresh our memories with a rundown of the week's main highlights. Uh, on Sunday night, there was the first of the new series of The House of Elliot, which, due to BBC cutbacks, is to be retitled The Front Sitting Room of Elliot. <laughs> on Tuesday night on ITV, there was maybe Nicholson catches up with Tom Jones. Uh, he must be slowing down a bit. Uh, on BBC One on Thursday, a program featuring a controversial and often suppressed relationship and a traditional tale of male bonding. That's all in Noddy and Big Ears. Uh, joining me and generally uh, sticking their oar in at appropriate and probably inappropriate moments are Alison Craig and Nick Hancock. But uh, in the meantime, it's on with the show. Most uh, foreigners regard British television as the best in the world, and the reason is quite clear. They've never watched it. <laughs> but, uh, nowhere is the uh, sheer variety and excitement of British TV more amply illustrated than in the weekly top ten, which in the time-honored tradition of Top of the Pops, we shall now bring you. At number 10, with 13 million viewers, Wednesday's episode of Neighbours. That was the episode when Helen put the kettle on and made a cup of tea. <laughs> well, at number 9, Thursday's Neighbours, in which Helen then drank the tea with Michael and Jim. I'm sure many will remember that episode. In there at number 8, Neighbours on Tuesday, when Madge made a cup of tea. One of the highlights of the week. At number seven, Neighbours on Friday, when Pam put the kettle on, but Helen controversially drank the tea. <laughs> Up there at number six, with 14 and a half million viewers, Neighbours on Monday, understandably the most watched of them all, because intriguingly, neither Pam nor Helen made a cup of tea, Helen being too busy stirring the stew. Obviously accounts for that extra million and a half viewers. At number five, EastEnders on Tuesday, when Sharon embarked on a passionate illicit affair with her husband's brother and later made him a cup of tea. <laughs> At number four, with 15 and a half million viewers, Coronation Street on Friday, in which Bet smoked a cigarette, Raquel served Mavis a grapefruit juice, Vera stroked Lisa's hair, and Gail and Alma shocked early evening audiences by making a cup of tea. <laughs> Into the top three, and at number three, Coronation Street on Monday, when Audrey drank a glass of dry martini. Obviously, run out of tea. Still at number two, EastEnders on Thursday, when Hattie offered Michelle a digestive biscuit, and Steve drank a cup of coffee. A particular oversight on the part of the writers, once again keeping it off the top spot. Which means at number one, for the fourth week running, it's Coronation Street on Wednesday, when the oil refinery exploded in a sheet of flame after the firebomb attack by the Bulgarian Secret Service. <laughs> Sorry, that was the James Bond film afterwards. In fact, uh, Gail and Audrey had a cup of tea. <laughs> Nick. Well, here on ITV, football is free. We may not have any of it, but it is free. Premier League football, of course, has now decamped to Sky, who show a live match on Sundays, exactly like ITV did last year, only with the exciting, radical new element of having to fork out five quid to watch it. So that must mean they're making about 35 quid a game. <laughs> so, what do you get for your extra pennies? Well, apart from the joy of listening to Jack Charlton, one thing they have promised is even more stunning new camera angles. There's the standard elevated wide shot. Hodge in the wall, it's the Rigo. The reverse elevated wide shot. Hodge in the wall, it's the Rigo. Has it? Oh, my word, what a goal that was! The lateral static touchline angle. Hodge in the wall, it's the Rigo. Has it? Oh, my word, what a goal that was! The rear angled net side the overview. Wall, it's the Rigo. Has it? Oh, my word, what a goal that was! And the oh my god, it's going to hit the camera Hodge shot. <laughs> Well, not to be outdone, we are now able to bring you two brand new camera angles. The soul of Tony DeRigo's boot shot. <laughs> <laughs> oh my word, what a goal that was! 
was. And the camera in his shorts view. <laughs> it's the cameraman I feel sorry for. <laughs> We've also secured exclusive rights to the footage of last week's Italian Grand Prix, as seen from our hidden camera inside Nigel Mansell's cockpit. Well, uh, we intend to cover all aspects of television on this programme, and so for the first of her special reports, we gave Alison here a wide brief. She could cover politics, the arts, educational matters, or even the fascinating topic of deregulated broadcasting. But strangely, Alison decided to tackle a slightly different subject. Wobbly bottoms, slapping thighs, and a stream of four-letter words. They all go into this building, and none of them seem to come out. What happens is in here, they'll take your favourite feature film, take out all the really juicy, raunchy bits, and replace that with something, well, just a little bit more wholesome. I mean, did you see Mel Gibson in Lethal Weapon and wonder to yourself, was he really shouting, let's go and bury those funsters? I think not. We're going to go inside just now and meet a guy called Michael Spitzer. He's editing Bull Durham, the film with uh, Kevin Costner and Tim Robbins. At the moment, he's desperately trying to edit out Tim Robbins' bottom, and I'm going to beg him not to. <laughs> it was decided that the shot of a bare backside would be a little shocking so suddenly in people's living room living rooms so what we've done is we've retained the shot but we've at, we can actually through technical processes we can actually choose which part of the shot we show i've got a device here in this case <laughs> 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 well we can then drop it down oh i see yeah so when we drop the shot in and play it back this is the sort of thing you might get Tim Robbins' bottom, I think, is a spectacular example of sort of male buttockhood. I mean, do you find it offensive? Personally, no, um, but I just have to sometimes think that other people would. It's uh, very much, uh, I, you know, I'm editing things that I don't necessarily agree that I'm with the edits I'm doing. Who decides on the, the replacement for the rude words? Because there's some, there's some very funny uh, examples of, you know, a very obviously very rude word. Uh, one which, uh, what should we see, uh, the first part of its mother and the second bit <laughs> might be Cockney rhyming slang trucker, for instance, comes out as Melon Farmer. I mean, whose decision was that? Well, Melon Farmer was used in Film Repo Man, and that was actually the director, Alec, Alex Cox's decision. He knew that he had to make a clean version, and that was what he came up with. For the Spike Lee film, Do the Right Thing, which we showed uncut, in America, they replaced that phrase with Mike Tyson, for example, <laughs> and it just looked rather odd. And when as it, it turned out, that's from their worst swear word than ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, yes, um, that was obviously a decision made before Mike Tyson had his problem. Technology nowadays is amazing, though, that uh, you can actually physically take out a word and replace it with something completely different. For instance, in this occasion, uh, Kevin Costner saying, Dick, take the word out and totally change it. Normally, we wouldn't actually do this as an edit. Dick is not that offensive a word, but it is technically possible to just do an edit so you can take, you get up to the beginning of the dick, you mark that, and then it's <laughs> okay. You can, mark, you can mark the word that is offensive and then replace it with another word which is less offensive, as we've done here. Well, my AAA contract gets bought out so I can hold the flavor of my stick in the bus league. Is that it? Dave, the editor, can just slot in the new word at the touch of a few buttons. A far cry from the days when the only solution was to cut a bit of film out by hand and put it in backwards. Before the advent of computers, cuff off was a favourite film swear word. <laughs> well, my AAA contract gets bought out so I can hold the flavour of the month's hand in the bus leagues. Is that it? Well, the hell with this friggin' game. How would you actually respond to the statistic that 85% of your viewers wouldn't mind seeing full-blooded sexual intercourse over their cornflakes in the morning, but it's the 15% that you actually pander to that are the ones that actually bother to write in? If enough people wrote in and said, we think what you did to this film, chopping the language or losing that particular shot or changing it, was wrong, if enough people did that, then perhaps it would change the ideas of the powers that be. 
message there is writing and complain about the absence of bare bottoms or, uh, or swear words. Melon farming, is that true? Completely. I believe it. Yeah, it's absolutely true, yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of these things, actually, since, I've, uh, since I did that interview, I've been telling everybody about it, and now everybody only was wandering around going, you dirty melon farmer, and everything. <laughs> well, it's such an innocuous thing to suggest, isn't it, that someone's been farming melons, yeah. you know, <laughs> compared with uh, what it's supposed to be. Well, if it? melon is mother, then farming is obviously the other word, and mm -hmm. that puts a whole new slant on Farmers Weekly, doesn't it? And, <laughs> Farming program. <laughs> yes. And old MacDonald had a farm. <laughs> <laughs> the dirty old man he turned out to be. Yes. <laughs> anyway, the recent diaries, uh, the recent series video diaries, where ordinary members of the public were given home video cameras and encouraged to film their daily lives, was an unexpected hit for the BBC. If you remember switching on your TV to see shaky camera work, out of focus pictures, and incoherent conversations, you were probably watching The Word on the other side. <laughs> but, uh, the, the standards achieved by the amateurs on video diaries were so good that we thought you'd be interested to see a special video diary telling of a day in the life of a celebrated TV star. So, would you welcome, please, the very lovely Tony Hawks. Well, it's a bit of a coup for us to have you here, actually. It's very good of yes, you to squeeze is, us into your tight oh, schedule. Oh, it's a busy schedule, but... Uh... So I gather, yeah. So uh, how is uh, celebrity status treating you? Are you uh, managing to fit oh, in? Oh, I'm in? fitting in. You know, a lot of uh, autographs I've had to be doing outside, dealing with a lot of people, but I'm, uh, mm. they're controlling themselves pretty well. <laughs> yes, yes, you haven't been mobbed just yet. No, no, but, uh, uh, they're pretty excited, I can tell yes, you. Yes, I'm sure if you find enough money to pay them, I will. Um, well, I'm sure that uh, the, the audience are all uh, pregnant with anticipation to see your, uh, your particular personal video good, diary. Good so choice of words, I, uh, yes. I think so, yes. Let's have a look at it now. Okay. <laughs> 